there and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity brought to you by Bible Talk. And once again, on behalf of Mark, Alice, and myself, we do want to greet you in the wonderful, the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And let you know that we're blessed that you can be with us to spend time in God's Word, God's precious Word, His healing Word. Absolutely. His Word that builds faith, His Word that can change everything. Amen, amen, amen. We're continuing on in our study. I, I believe, this is an act of faith, I think, that we'll probably finish up our study in the call to ministry. Mm -hmm. This is the third part that we'll be doing today. Uh, and the other parts, again, are available there on the website at www.bibletalk.com. So I just pray this will be a blessing for you and be, be both an encouragement and instruction on the fact that we are each called to ministry. Yes. It's, it's not just that spiritual elite. It's all of us who are called to ministry. So we're going to talk about that. But before we do, Brother Mark is going to ask God's blessing on our time together today. Well, Lord, we thank you that you're here within our midst. And we just ask you to guide this Bible study so you can do heart surgery on us. So we can know more of your word and more of your love. Amen. 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 All right. Uh, we were talking, we ended last week talking about the fact that the Lord, when he calls you to do something, mm -hmm. he equips you to do something. Always. Always. He, uh, we talked about, the, uh, unlike the Pharaoh of Egypt, all right? So he knows the ministry he's called you to, and he mm -hmm. will equip you for it. Because he said, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Says that in Jeremiah 21, 29. So God, nothing takes God by surprise. Mm -hmm. And I promise you that nothing in your life is taking God by surprise. Yeah. He's had a call on your life from since when? Before the foundation. Well, he said to Jeremiah in Jeremiah mm -hmm. chapter one. In your mother's womb. He said, I before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Mm -hmm. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. You know, it says John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit while he was yet in his mother's womb. That's what I was thinking of. Yeah. And he also wrote the Lamb's b Book of Life before creation. Our names were written in the Lamb's, Lamb's Book of Life from before, before mm -hmm. the foundation of the earth. Mm -hmm. So understand that, that God has had his plan for you from the beginning. All right? You're the one that's just discovered. Yes, that's okay. right. We're All just right. discovering it. Yeah. It's not like we show up and God is surprised. Oh, look at him. He's going to yeah. know. Okay. So, but it's important to understand that, that, that you understand that God has had his hand on your life mm -hmm. from the beginning. Not from the time that you accepted him as Lord and Savior, but far before that, right? And he knows all the failings that we were going to fail. He knows them all yeah. before we even know it. He died for all of the failings. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Think about David. I mean, David is so important in the picture of the plan of, of God, right? David was a man after God's own heart. That's what it says, right? And the Lord chose him to serve his people. God chose him to serve his people mm -hmm. as king. But he called him to, to serve as shepherd. Yes. And Psalm 78 says this, starting in verse 70. He also chose David his servant and took him from among from the sheepfolds, from the care of the ewes with suckling lambs. He brought him to shepherd Jacob his people and Israel his inheritance. So he shepherded them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them with his skillful hands. Don't you understand that David... And he showed his faithfulness in being a shepherd That's to his natural father's flock. Mm -hmm. That was God's preparing him for what would come. And David, it says, did it with the, in, with the in, in integrity with, in his That's heart right. and with skillful hands. Whatever ministry you are called to, I pray <coughs> that you would fulfill it, first of all, with integrity. All right? With a purity of heart and with skillful, skillful hands. hands. Now, where are you going to get the skillful hands? God has appointed in the church apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to equip you for the work of service. 
God's word equips you for the word of, work of service. And the Holy Spirit, who was sent to lead you into all truth, lives within you. All right? So apply those skills that God has given you. The Lord took a shepherd who was faithful to his father's call and gave him the ministry of shepherding his people. He took Peter, Mm -hmm. who was a fisherman, grew up in a family of fishermen, and called him to be a fisher of men. I mean, he had his hand on him from the beginning. He had his hand on you from the beginning. Mm -hmm. It's not that God used their skills and talents to serve his purposes. It was that he had been preparing them with their skills and talents all of their lives for his coming call. Everything that's going on in your life, God will use. Remember, he's the potter, we're the clay. Yes. He's molding and shaping. So, isn't that what it sounds like when David wrote in Psalm 139? Mm-hmm. You know the psalm? For you formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. Psalm 139, verses 13 and 14. We are the work of his hands. We are the sheep of his pasture. And his work, his works are wonderful. His works are incredible. (laughs) Yeah, and you know what? You are his work. Yes. That's why you're precious in his sight. The world is so concerned, it seems, particularly in, the, in our Western civilization. Is it civilized? In our, in our Western culture, how is that? Mm. With the whole concept of self-esteem. Mm. And it's, it's destroying lives, I believe. Yes, it is. When you understand how much God esteems you, that God says that you are precious in his sight, and that you, you are the work of his hands, you'll never have a problem with, self, with esteem. No. Okay, you'll know that you're precious in his sight. One of the things that I really want to talk about, uh, because we, we have covered a lot in the last couple of weeks, is the fact that the ministry that God calls you to is about God's, God's people mm-hmm. and God's church. His people and his church. It is so extremely, extremely dangerous to forget that truth. And that sounds, please think about this, right? Because that's not the case all too often today. All too often today, people see it as their their church, Mm -hmm. all right? It's their kingdom. They they see it as their their kingdom, all right? Think about who's the wisest person you can think of right off the bat. Solomon. Solomon. King Solomon. Mm -hmm. Solomon, David's son was gifted by the Lord with wisdom beyond compare, right? Here's what it says in 1 Kings chapter 3. I'm going to start at verse 11. And he, he's talking to Solomon. And he says, God said to him, Because you have asked this thing, and have not asked for yourself long life, nor have asked riches for yourself, nor have you asked for the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself discernment to understand justice. Behold, I have done according to your words. Behold, I have given you a wise and discerning heart, so that there has been no one like you before, and no one like you shall arise after you. I have also given you what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that there will not be any among the kings like you in all your days." Is that not a case yes. of God equipping and preparing somebody for the ministry he's called to? Absolutely, yeah. That's what it sounds like. That's what it is. And was that a mid-course correction? I don't understand that. what you mean. Okay. God prepares us from when before we were born. Yes. But because he asked for wisdom, no, did God I give him mean, more? Well, he, At that yeah, time? No, no, it's not, not It's not a correction. God gave him what he asked for. That's yeah. what he says. He says, I gave you what you asked for, right? Because he was asking for wisdom in order to be able to shepherd God's, God's people. people. That, it wasn't that was, for himself. It right. wasn't for himself, right? Yet, Solomon became the perfect, or, or I probably should say the imperfect example of pastoral burnout. Mm-hmm. 
he forgot why God had so wonderfully equipped him. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 15. Here's what Solomon wrote. He said, Then I said to myself, As is the fate of the fool, it will also befall me. Why then have I been extremely wise? So I said to myself, This too is vanity. He forgot why the Lord had given him wisdom. He said, Why have I been extremely wise? Can you see that? Yeah. He forgot why he why God had given him the wisdom. The call to serve the Lord should bring immense joy into our lives as we've been given the opportunity to be used in the lives of others. And yet we find, and I'm going to read, I'm going to read you some statistics from just a, a few years ago, right? Mm -hmm. From a, a, a site that specializes in this. They said 13% of active pastors, here, we're talking about in the U.S., are divorced. 33% felt burned out within their first five years of ministry. 40% of pastors and 47% of the spouses are suffering from burnout, frantic schedules, and unrealistic expectations. Wait a second. That was 40% of the pastors and 47% of the spouses. Yes, that's what So it the spouses were burnt, more burnt out than the pastors. Yes. <laughs> they have a tough job. <laughs> they have a tougher job. They do. I've, I've, awesome. I've often said that. I mean, you yeah. know, I've said it many, many times over the years. That the toughest job I know of in the church is uh, being a pastor's wife. I've said that, right? 75% re report severe stress causing anguish, worry, bewilderment, anger, depression, fear, and alienation. These are people in ministry. Mm -hmm. But no, thinking about that, they wouldn't have, I mean, the job wouldn't be tough if they were doing it God's way. Well, you're getting ahead of me. Oh, I, I, well, no, yeah. I, that's, that's fair to say, but... Doctors, lawyers, and clergy have the most problems with drug abuse, alcohol, and suicide. 1,500 U.S. pastors leave their ministries each month due to burnout, conflict, and moral failure. So now think about this. Here, Solomon has been gifted with this wisdom. He has been gifted with riches and honor. And yet here he is, later on in life, and he's writing, and I'm going to go on in verse 17 of Ecclesiastes 2, and here's what he wrote. So I hated life, mm -hmm. for the work which had been done under the sun was grievous to me, because everything is futility and striving after wind. How did the world's wisest man let this happen? The answer is in that same chapter of the Word. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you haven't ever heard this, I mean, take time to go read it. I'm going to read from Ecclesiastes 2, starting at verse 4. Here's what Solomon said. I enlarged my works. I built houses for myself. I planted vineyards for myself. I made gardens and parks for myself. And I planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made ponds of water for myself, from which to irrigate a forest of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves, and I had home-born slaves, also, I possessed flocks and herds larger than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. Also, I collected for myself silver and gold in the treasure of kings and provinces. I provided for myself male and female singers and the pleasures of men, many concubines. Then I became great and increased more than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. My wisdom also stood by me. All that my eyes desired, I did not refuse them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure, for my heart was pleased because of all my labor, and this was my reward for all my labor. My works for myself, for myself, for myself, over and over. Solomon had stopped focusing on the kingdom of God and chose to build his, his own, own kingdom. kingdom. And that's what so many pastors are doing. And if the right. wisest among us does it... That's why I... We, listen, yeah, it's, this it's, is it's here. A, it's a trap to... Get. All scripture, Paul wrote, is, is God-breathed and yeah. profitable. It's profitable for training in righteousness. It's profitable for correction. It's profitable for, profitable for reproof. God is putting it here. The, the reason I'm saying this here is this is a caution for all of us, mm -hmm. regardless of what minister you're in. Whether you're the, the, the apostle of a great big group of churches or you're the sweeper in the back of the church and you take care of that every week. Whatever you are called to, 
there's a danger that you start taking pride in it, you start doing it for yourself mm-hmm. rather than for God. I hear a lot of people talking about the churches that they started, the churches they built. You know, Jesus said, I will build my church, mm-hmm. okay? So that's why that very same problem plagues many pastors and other ministers today. Yes. Particularly, I think, in the Western world. All too many pastors are building their own kingdoms. They call them congregations, but they're their kingdoms, mm-hmm. rather than God's kingdom. All too many ministers are more concerned with building the, their ministries than building God's kingdom. Right? Remember from the beginning of this study, the gifts of God given for ministry are given for the common good, Thanks. not one person's. So the answer to growing weary of the task is very simple. In the midst of increasing burnout, and, and we see so many fall, it says in Isaiah 40, verse 31, Yet those who wait upon the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles, They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. Those who wait upon the Lord. Uh, You know, of course that means, okay, don't don't get out ahead of the Lord. Don't Mm -hmm. do things on your own. But I want to use that term. Do they have waiters in restaurants? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. They don't stand around and do nothing. No. Waiting. No, they're waiting on. They're serving. They're waiting on, right? Mm Mm-hmm. We live in an age of political correctness when it comes to language, right? So yes. mm-hmm. soon it will be uh, food order processing and delivery technicians. Say that again. <laughs> I, it, they won't be waiters or servers. They'll be food order processing and delivery technicians. <laughs> well, the, the old garbage guy, he's a sanitation engineer now, right? right. right. <laughs> That's because of our pride. We want, you know, we want to have as much exaltation as we can possibly have. What was Jesus? What what's when he was here on earth? What did God the Father call him? My son. He also called him my servant. Mm. Go read Isaiah fifty three. Yes. It yeah. tells of the reason he sent him. It says that he is his servant. He's a, Jesus was a bond servant. Okay. And Jesus knew his place, as he said, I didn't come to to be served, I came, came to, to serve. serve. Because all ministry is serving. Yes. Serve God. Ministry is a calling. It's not a job. No. And it's certainly not about you. Okay? Any ministry, every ministry is a calling, and it must be in the truest sense of the word, a vocation. I don't know how much you hear that word anymore. Vocation. Vocation. Probably not a lot. I mean, I haven't heard it a lot. Even when you were younger? No, when I was younger. It's it's usually associated with the Catholics. No, it comes from the Latin. I mean, they they talk about it. No, it was very common. You know, go back 40 years. It was a a common word. A a vocation is a calling. It comes from the Latin word, vocare, to be called. So yeah, so Catholics get life. Catholics yeah. get a, 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 you know have a vocation. Don't you have a vocation? A calling? Yeah. From God. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. We each should. Now I, I'm going to tell you part of the problem in the body of Christ today is most people don't know what their calling is mm-hmm. because we have come to the place where, and I mentioned this before, our dear brother going to be with the Lord, Arthur Burt, used to talk about he was looking for the end of the one-man show. Mm -hmm. You can spend your life in church and never have even a thought about your calling. You go, there's going to be somebody, and we expect the pastor to spend all week on his face before God, get get the the booming voice of God and come back and give it to you in 15, 20 minutes. You know, and uh, somebody else is going to play music. Okay. Okay. (laughs) But the fact of the matter is, You can't just sit there and be a spectator. Uh, Write this down. Christianity is not a spectator sport. Mm -mm. Okay? It's a call, and with that call, you have to be willing to lay down your life. Right? Yes. I'm going to read John John chapter 10, and I'm going to start at verse 11. I'm going to read verse 11 to 15 and 17 to 18. Right? 
This is Jesus speaking. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand and is not concerned about the sheep. I am the good shepherd. And I know my own and my own know me. Even as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I receive from my Father. The Lord doesn't provide for all our needs because he's paying us for our labors but simply because we are the children he loves mm -hmm. and cares for. Yes. Ministry is a labor of love, not a job, when one becomes a bondservant of the Most High God, mm -hmm. right? And a bondservant is somebody, you know, we were all in slavery to sin. Yes. That's what the Word of God says, all right? Jesus came to set the captives free. Mm -hmm. So we've been set free. I've had people really get upset with me. Because I use that, I talk so much about being a bondservant of the Most High God, like Paul did, like yeah. Peter did, yeah. like some, like James did. All right. Well, the fact is, He did set us free. But a a bondservant is somebody who chooses, set free, chooses to stay and serve after being set free. Go read Exodus chapter twenty-one. All right. The difference between a shepherd and a hireling is this: a shepherd works because he loves the Lord, and the church. And a hireling works because he gets paid by the church. Mm -hmm. All too often, people get into the five-fold ministry because of the benefits. Mm -hmm. uh, it's lucrative. It, it, can, it, can be, it can be a very lucrative, comfortable job. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no doubt about it. And it often brings stability and security. Yes. That's not really available in the world sometimes, okay? It brings respect. But typically only if you're doing it wrong. Right. All right. Well, I'm serious. You should be tickling the ears. <laughs> I, I, I want to tell you, I mean, Alice comes from an Irish background. Her mother was born in Ireland, and mm -hmm. right? We spent time in Ireland. Mm -hmm. My mother uh, comes from an Irish heritage, a large Irish Catholic family. Mm -hmm. And it was commonplace because, remember, the, the, uh, the immigration, the massive immigration of Irish people into the U.S. was because of a potato famine. Potato famine, famine right. I mean, they didn't have enough to eat to survive in Ireland at the time. So they came here. When they came here, and they're coming into New York. Remember, all the immigrants were coming in through New York City mm -hmm. at that time. Mm -hmm. Ellis Island. So what would happen was these Irish families would say, their, where the real security was, the police and firemen, right. and the priesthood, and or the nuns. Mm -hmm. And the priests... I mean, they, they have nice places to live. They have somebody to take care of them, a housekeeper. They, have a, they always have their meals guaranteed. It, it had security that no, most other jobs didn't have. That's right. So, they, so I'm not saying everybody didn't, but many, many people were drawn into that simply because of the benefits of the job. Mm -hmm. They were encouraged to do so by their families. In the natural, it makes sense. But we're not supposed to be operating in the natural, Okay. Okay, I'm not going to go into that much more. But remember that the Pharisees, they were rewarded for the religious service. That was their ministry. They were rewarded for it. They were rewarded with honor and praise on earth. And they certainly had job security. They certainly had comfortable lives. But Jesus said they received their reward in full. Mm -hmm. in, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise... You have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. Not little, it's not diminished. You have no reward, right? So when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be honored by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. You know, we, we often sing that old hymn in church, Count Your Blessings. Did you ever sing it? I don't know when we often sing no. it anymore. It's kind yeah. of faded. Yeah. Count your blessing. Count them one by. Count. All right? 
that's that's a nice song, and it's it's a good thing to do to count your blessings. And but Jesus said, count the cost. Right. In the Gospel of Luke, in the fourteenth chapter, Jesus said this: If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life. He cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. <sighs> Jesus also said in the Gospel of Matthew, you'll be hated by all because of my name, but it is the one who endured to the end who will be saved. The word hate um, in my Bible has a footnote, and it says, <clears throat> by comparison of his love for me. Well, yeah, you, when, when you hate something, you don't treasure it. Right. You don't... You don't put it ahead of everything else. I mean, that's that's one of the things you need to understand. It's mm -hmm. it's not like you have to be mean to it. It's not like right. a, I mean, because when, when people hear the mm -hmm. word hate, they it's like this vengeance and this. Well, I pray that the Holy Spirit ministers to you, mm -hmm. because you're still called to honor your mother and father. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. But the fact of the matter is, there is nothing that you can put in front of God. Right. right. You have there, to love Him more than more anybody than anything. Else. Right. Anybody. That's right. God will call you to do things you don't want to do. Yes. I mean, most people get called to ministry and they go do things they want to do, mm -hmm. right? But the fact is, when God called Abraham, he went out not knowing where he was going, right? When Isaiah stood in the presence of the Lord and heard him say in the temple, right? In the high and lifted up, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Mm -hmm. He did not respond by saying, oh, where or for how long? He just said, here I am, here am I, send me, mm -hmm. right? Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh when he was called. Mm -hmm. So he responded to the call and went in the other direction. God took care of that. Yeah. Peter was told by Jesus that his ministry would take him where he did not want to go. All right? Jesus did not want to go in the natural to the cross. No. He did not. He said, if this cup could pass, please let it. But he, then he said, not my will, thy will be done. When you approach your ministry, whatever the ministry is, you had better have that attitude. That's right. Not my will, but thy will be done. Because otherwise, you know what? In your ministry, you'll start doing your will. And it'll be your ministry like and not Simon. God's. Well, like, like Solomon. Okay. Okay. Um, we're out of time again, Ernie. Oh. And we didn't finish. We didn't. I didn't mean to fib to you. Just uh, <laughs> there's so much in this, there's so much meat in this topic, and I promise you that there'll be more to feast on yes. as we get deeper into this. I keep wanting to get to the deep place. All right. So be back with us again next week as we look at God's call on your life to serve Him, on your life to be used by Him for the glory of His name. Oh. Father, we thank you that you can. Lord, that you can still use the foolish to shame the wisdom of the wise. Lord God, that it's not dependent on our strength, but on yours, Lord God. Lord, use us to touch other lives to, with your blessing, with your love, with your word. We praise you and thank you, Lord, that you can do that and you choose to do that in Jesus' name. Well, Amen. again, until next time, God bless you and goodbye. Bye.